You and I both know that when it comes to studying for the board exam, what we really need to do is practice questions over and over and over again until we master um, critical thinking questions. Because that's what the board exam is going to ask you. Lots and lots of critical thinking questions where you're applying your knowledge. Let's start with some simple questions. And then I'm hoping in the next few weeks, I'll upload some case study questions so that we can uh, review together. Okay, so the first question, th these are all period-based questions, is a patient has a nine millimeter um, of attachment loss on a maxillary first molar. The hygienist applies moderate pressure against the occlusal surface in an upward direction. Upward being the key word here. The hygienist is assessing for what? I'll let you read through the options. Feel free to pause the video. Okay, so A is asking for um, vertical tooth mobility. And let's just review what vertical tooth mobility is. I'm going to pull up the mobility slide. Here we go. To test for mobility, we always use two ends of an instrument, and it's always the end of an instrument, never the finger. Never assess mobility with the finger, or we will not get accurate um, readings. Always use the ends of an instrument. And if you uh, um, can move the tooth uh, less than one millimeter, so very little, it's class one. Class two, if it can be shifted, if it's mobile up to um, you know one to two millimeters. And class three is if it's really mobile to the point that, and sometimes what can happen, so class three is if it's mobile, so more than two millimeters. And also if it is depressible in the socket. So if you can take a um, an instrument and if you can, I'm going to draw this arrow here to show that if it can go get depressed into the socket, that is a class 3 mobility. So class 3 mobilities can be two things. A, it can be depressible in the socket. And if it can be moved um, horizontally more than 2 millimeters. So 2 millimeters and more is class 3. And also, um, an additional thing to even look at is if it is depressible in the socket it's class 3 mobility. So going back to this uh, this question here, if you can get this upward direction, if you can get, if you put pressure and you can push down on it and the tooth goes up and down the socket, like um, this over here, and you can go up and down, that is vertical tooth mobility. So the answer here is A. Horizontal tooth mobility is, in this example, what they're trying to assess for is horizontal tooth mobility where it can go back and forth horizontally. Vertical is up and down, horizontal is side to side. Let's look at Fremitus. What is Fremitus? So I have a slide here that shows how you can assess for Fremitus. So what you do is you take your finger, your index finger, and you put it on the front surface of a tooth. And you get the client to uh, bite down together. And if you feel vibration, because Fremitus is vibration, if you feel vibration, if you feel the teeth moving, that's Fremitus. Now, why does this happen? Well, this could happen because maybe when they're biting, their bite, um, their, the, the way they're biting is off. And so perhaps just an occlusal adjustment, so just burning down some teeth, um, or just adjusting their bite, rather, sorry, adjusting their bite can help reduce the Fremitus. Um, less commonly, ortho treatments might be needed um, to reduce Fremitus. So something's wrong with their bite, and that is why they're getting Fremitus. That is why they're getting vibration, which can be assessed this way on the maxillary teeth. Or, and you can assess it in all the anterior teeth. So that's Fremitus. And the last one they, um, they're they talking about is furcation involvement. So there's uh, four classes for furcation involvement. There's three classes for mobility. And in the description, I'm going to link a video where I go over mobility and furcation in a lot of detail. So feel free to uh, watch those videos if you need a refresher. All right, let's move on to the next question. The dental hygienist is assessing a mandibular molar tooth with a neighbor's furcation probe. Remember, for um, assessing furcation, we always use the neighbor's probe, which is a curved probe. The furcation probe passes completely through the furcation between the mesial and distal roots. However, the entrance to the furcation is not visible clinically. The level of furcation involvement should be recorded as a class of... One, two, three, four. So I'll let you reread that if you need to and tell me and think about what you think the answer is. So if you said C, you would be correct. If you can take a neighbor's probe, which kind of looks like this, and you can, you know, thread it through and it 
goes from the mesial to the distal and it comes out on the distal side, but it is vis it is um, not visible. What that means when it, when it says here that the entrance certification is not visible clinically, that means it's covered by the gums. So the gums cover the furcation. So we cannot see the furcation. If that is the case and you're getting a through and through, so it's going from the means, it's going from the one side and going all the way to the other side, that's class three. Class four is where the furcation is visible. Class three, the vacation is not visible. So therefore, um, the answer is class three. Class one is when you take the vacation probe and it, you can kind of just feel the vacation, but you can't really go halfway. That's class one. Class two is you can go halfway, but it doesn't come out on the other side. That's class two. Class three is where it can come out on the other side. It passes completely, the vacation probe passes through the vacation completely, but it is covered by gums. And class four, if there's recession, you can totally see the vacation completely visible. And remember, these are the symbols for the classifications. So refresh your memory um, on vacation. It's really important. Here's another question. The major difference between the periodontal screening and recording, the PSR, and a comprehensive period charting, this is the probing charting that you guys um, do all the time in clinic, is what? And I'm going to pause, um, get you to pause the video and read the um, options and then let me know what you think. So the first one is saying PSR uses a regular probe and the perio charting, the periodontal charting requires a who probe. Well, it's actually the opposite. The PSR uses a who probe. This is what a who probe looks like. Let's pull this up. This is a who probe and it has a ball tip and the ball tip is there to help you detect calculus or defective margins like overhang. So that's what the ball tip is for. So this is a who probe and a who probe has a colored band and that band, it starts at, um, I'm just gonna see if I can write it down. So this is 3.5 millimeters and the very ending over here is the last part of the black band is 5.5 millimeters. So that is the length of the black band. And that's this black band is really important because if when you're probing and the gum goes like, halfway so it partially covers the um the probe then the code that you are giving for that section is a code three and if that band is completely covered so when you're probing you don't see that band at all then it's given the code four now the psr is treated differently it's not like how you regularly probe there are different um, components to it so I do encourage you to watch my PSR video so that you can um, understand how to do a PSR but just to quickly recap there is one probe per section so I could uh, someone could get like a reading you know such as this for example where um, the highest number someone can get is actually a code four in this case the highest number is a code three but each section is given one code okay please review that video if on PSR if you're unfamiliar with PSR Okay, so it can't be A because PSR uses a who probe. Let's look at C. PSR does not take bleeding points into consideration. A comprehensive periodontal charting does. PSR does look at bleeding. While we don't chart it, so this is what a PSR charting would look like. Yes, we don't chart that there's bleeding, um, but it is something we look for. So if you look at code zero, code zero means there's no bleeding. If you look at code one, code one means there is bleeding. So the difference between a zero and a one is bleeding. So if, uh, you know, if this person, if a section two has bleeding, we're notifying that by putting a code one to indicate that it has bleeding. So bleeding does, um, is something we do take into consideration with PSR. PSR does not take recession into consideration. A comprehensive periodontal charting does. Well, PSR does take recession into consideration because one of the things you'll look at in that video, and I know I don't have it listed here, is sometimes we can put an asterisk next to a number. And that asterisk can tell you many things. It can tell you that this section has, you know, a uh, vacation. This section could have recession. And if the recession is more, is 3.5 millimeters or more, okay, then it's a uh, an asterisk is indicated. So P 
Okay, so it does look at recession, not as thoroughly as the comprehensive period assessment, but we can put an asterisk next to a number if there is a lot of recession, if it's 3.5 millimeter or more of recession, an asterisk is given, as well as other things um, like vacation, but again, and mobility. But again, we'll look. I want you to look at that video if you don't remember how to do a PSR. And the video will be linked in the description. Okay, so let's go back to B. PSR records one code for each sectant, and a comprehensive periodontal charting records six reading for each tooth. Yes, this is the correct answer. Because when you do a PSR, this is something what you, you this is something that you could see. This is a PSR. Um, and when you look at a, a period charting, if you look at one tooth, for example, we do take six readings and let's see how we can take six readings just to recap we look at the mesial reading we look at the lingual reading we look at the distal lingual so mesial lingual distal lingual and then we'll look at the mesial buccal reading uh, buccal and the distal buccal right so there are mesial lingual distal lingual oh, apologize for the messiness but you can see that there are six different readings that we take for one tooth and that's what this is saying we do take six readings for each tooth a PSR, we record one reading, one code for each sectant. A patient has undergone repeated appropriate periodontal therapy for over, uh, over the past five years. Today, the hygienist notes additional attachment loss at several sites. The patient practices satisfactory self-care and follows the recommended program of periodontal maintenance visits. Which of the following is most likely disease classification for this patient? Periodontitis, redundant periodontitis, recurrent periodontitis, or refractory periodontitis. Think about it. I'm going to circle the answer. The answer is D. Now let's look at all the options. But one thing I want to know is process of I want you guys to know is process of elimination. Redundant periodontitis is a term that doesn't really exist. It's not one that I've seen commonly used in the um, period textbook. But I have seen periodontitis. I have seen recurrence and refractory periodontitis. So now we got to figure out, is it A, C, or D? Let's look at what's unique about this patient. This patient comes regularly for a cleaning. Um, follows a periodontal maintenance uh, program, so they come every three months or every four months, their hygiene is pretty good. So they're doing everything they can because they're br brushing and flossing, they're coming every three months, they've been coming regularly for the past five years, but yet they're getting more attachment loss, yet they're getting bone loss. Why? Like, why is that happening? What, what type of category does that fall under? What disease classification does that fall under? Well, let's look at the difference between recurrent and refractory. Recurrent periodontitis, this is when someone has perio because they're not doing a good job with their self-care. They're not coming regularly for maintenance visits. They're sort of not coming every three months. So recurrent periodontitis is when it's the patient's fault. Okay, this is the patient's fault. And it's the patient's fault because they're not doing good oral hygiene and they're not coming regularly to see us. Refractory periodontitis is when it's not the patient's fault. Okay, so it's not the patient's fault. The patient is doing the patient is doing everything they can. Um, they are coming regularly for a cleaning. They are sorry, they're coming regularly for a cleaning, and they are practicing good oral self care. The way I remember it is there is an F over here, um, and F you can say frustrating. Maybe the pa the patient feels frustrated. I can say frustrated. Um, the patient feels uh, frustrated because they're doing everything they can, but yet they're getting more attachment loss, yet they're getting more bone loss. In this case, what I would do is if you see a client like this and you know we don't understand why it's getting worse, even though we're doing a good job and they're doing a good job with their oral hygiene, maybe there's some underlying systemic um, conditions that we don't know about. So maybe you want, want you might want to refer them to a doctor and see if you know maybe they, there could be some underlying reasons. Are they diabetic, but they don't know it? Do they have any other, you know, disease, but they're not sure of? So we should get that further looked at. Okay, so refractory periodontitis is not the patient's fault. We don't know why it's happening. Recurrent periodontitis is it's the patient's fault. 
So periodontitis would be correct, but the better answer is refractory periodontitis because they're doing everything they can. And when they're doing everything they can, um, and yet we're seeing bone loss, it would be refractory periodontitis. Let's do one more. Your patient is 40 years old. A periodontal assessment shows the following. Purplish swollen gingiva. Recession of the gingival margin. Generalized loss of attachment. Patient reports gums that bleed during brushing, but no pain. Which of the following is most likely, so it's the most likely disease classification for this patient? Plaque-induced gingivitis, non-plaque-induced gingival disease, periodontitis, or refractory periodontitis. Okay, so we're seeing that the gums are swollen. Um, okay, so we're seeing swollen gums, so that means there's inflammation. We know that there's bleeding. Bleeding is another sign of inflammation. We're seeing recession, and we're seeing loss of attachment. Okay, so those are the main things that I want to point out here. Now, what is the main difference between gingivitis and periodontitis? Well, gingivitis, there's no attachment loss. There's no bone loss. Periodontitis, there is bone loss. So immediately, because I see loss of attachment, that automatically says that, okay, it cannot be gingivitis. Because with gingivitis, there's no loss of attachment. There's no bone loss. So now it's between C and D. Is it periodontitis or is it refractory periodontitis? Refractory periodontitis, remember the F for frustration, frustrated, is when the client is doing everything they can. Um, but perio is still coming back. Now, there's no indication here that the client is doing everything they can. So we're just going to cross this out and we're going to go with C. If there was further indication, if they said that, you know, uh, the client's doing everything they can, you know, practicing good oral self-care, coming regularly to see us, then yeah, it could be D. But there's no indication of that. So the best answer is C, periodontitis. Why? Because there's a loss of attachment. That's your That's your number one reason, loss of attachment. Um, another thing as a side note is this thing here is saying no pain. There is only one condition, one disease classification where um, a client feels pain. Can anyone think what, of what that could be? So nug or nup, that's what it used to be called. Um, necrotizing periodontal disease okay so necrotizing periodontal disease so necrotizing periodontal disease is when they feel pain that's usually one of the um, only disease classification where pain is felt all the other ones like gingivitis periodontitis typically there's no pain associated with that but with necrotizing periodontal disease there is necrotizing is when the tissues are literally dying it's like necrosis um very very painful and uh we can go, I do have another question on this. So later on, when I post more questions, we'll look at um, what necrotizing periodontal disease uh, type of question could be in the board exam. All right. Thanks for listening. If you want to, you know, be in the loop with um, seeing more questions where we can go over it together, don't forget to subscribe so that you are notified. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Good luck studying.